I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Sir Paul Marshall, a co-founder and chairman of Marshall Waste Asset Management, which is Europe's largest hedge fund overseeing $48 billion in assets. The firm specializes in long-short equity management and notably combines fundamental investing with systematic and quantitative strategies. Paul recently authored the book, Ten and a Half Lessons from Experience, Perspectives on Fund Management, and the show completes a trifecta of consecutive book authors whose work I thoroughly enjoyed this summer. Alongside his long history in the business, Paul has been deeply involved in philanthropy focused on education, and he was knighted for his work in 2016. And if that's not quite enough, his son Winston is a band member of the popular folk rock band Mumford & Sons. Our conversation covers Paul's background, the history of Marshall Waste, and the firm's evolution. We touch on his thoughts about quantitative and qualitative investing and on internal and external fund management. And then we turn to his new book, covering lessons relating to market efficiency, skill, portfolio construction, shorting, man and machines, size, and careers. Today's show is sponsored by Diligence Vault, a technology platform built specifically for manager research, operational due diligence, compliance, and ESG teams with rigorous diligence, data collection, and questionnaire processes. Diligence Vault has over 15,000 users on the platform globally and is backed and used by Goldman Sachs with other clients, including Wells Fargo, Utimco, and NEPC. Digitize your fund diligence today at diligencevault.com slash trial, where they're offering free trials of the platform through the end of the year. Today's show is sponsored by Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. Sophisticated multi-asset class investors need high-tech and high-touch data management solutions for the front and middle offices. Northern Trust Front Office Solutions combines high-powered functionality with exceptional client service to help asset allocators efficiently evaluate their portfolios, accelerate their insights, and mitigate their operational risk. Visit northerntrust.com slash solutions to learn more. Please enjoy my conversation with Sir Paul Marshall. Paul, terrific to see you. And lovely to see you, Ted, after all these years. Yeah, it's been a little while. Why don't we start even way before that and how you first got interested in investing? I first got interested in, I was working as a trainee in Lloyds Bank International in Zurich. And it was very early days, first thing I did after university. And I had to do a rotation in every financial function of the bank. And I, I did credit analysis, FX trading, cashier, everything, letters of credit. At the end of the two years, I worked in the investment department with a Mr. Maurer. And that was the first time I found something that I actually really loved. And it was just being asked to look at a few companies and think about the stock market. And that was the first time. What was it about it that you love so much? Looking at a company, it's both art and science, and it distills so many different things from the understanding the the management, the industry, the structure of the industry, the position of the company in the industry, through to the macro background, interest. You have to understand every dimension really of everything to do with the economy from the macro right down to the very small detail and it's both romantic and historical and empirical and just everything so when you first started that interest really in the equity market how did you start to learn what you came to believe about how markets work it's been a very very long apprenticeship and i'm still learning so I didn't learn a massive amount, actually, in Zurich. I then went to business school in Seattle, and then I went to Warburg's and went into the European investment 
department and I had some very good mentors and really learned on the spot. And it was learning by doing and learning by my mistakes from the beginning, which is how I started to learn. And the the right or wrong thing about ProChip Mercury or Warburg's of Mercury was the fund management business was that they gave you money to manage almost immediately. So actually, in my case, far too early, but I was given money to manage within six or nine months, which is ridiculous. <laughs> and I paid the consequences with some of the things I got wrong, but I learned by doing really. And what did you come to believe about how to add value in the equity markets? I went through quite a long process of looking at different types of ways of analyzing companies, EVA and CF. ROI and kind of different ways of putting all the numbers together. But the bottom line was, I suppose it's ultimately you're looking for companies where the long-term value is not appreciated by the market. And the long-term value is defined as the sum of all the cash flows. So you've got to understand why the cash flows of the companies will generate in the future will be significantly more than the market is appreciated. So it's very much weighing Ben Graham weighing machine philosophy but also combining that with catalysts. So it's never enough for me to just be looking at understanding a long-term undervaluation. You've got to have a, a catalyst which will draw people's attention to the valuation. So that was the, that was the kind of approach that I grew to like and it used pretty early on. So then somewhere along the way, you decided to form your own firm. With Ian. What was that initial inception story? Ian I'd known from the, remarkably, the very first day I worked in the city because he was head of sales, or at least very senior in sales. He was only 25, actually, but he had a meteoric career. And he called me on my first day at from Warburg's. And so we got to know each other and worked together very closely for a few years. Then we slightly went different ways because he then moved and became head of equity trading at Deutsche Bank. And I got a call from him in 1997 saying, let's have lunch. Now, Ian never does lunch, so this had to be quite important. And we had, this is the second lunch he'd done in his life, I think. And we went out to lunch and he said, let's set up a hedge fund. And as it happened at that point, I was talking to other people about setting up a long-only business. And I hadn't thought of doing a hedge fund. It was Ian proposed it and it was took me three or four months to discuss it with them and negotiate it and so on and then we took the leap and so what was the original Marshall Waste strategy so the original Marshall Waste planet strategy was it was the Eureka fund which is still the the flagship and it was European equity long short we were about the third hedge fund in Europe so we were well behind the curve vis-a-vis the US but we were relatively early in Europe we divided the fund into two components really what we call core and trading and the core investments were long ben graham or philip fisher long-term quality companies philip fisher you like companies which have great quality business and a quality management so they've got to be lucky and smart and then the trading side which was much more higher turnover very catalyst based looking for every opportunity in the market and, and one was one was lumpy concentrated and the other was less concentrated and much more active and that played to both of our backgrounds Ian's background was in trading my background well, was in longer term investing and that was that was the original proposition and we raised 50 million dollars of which half was from Soros the rest was from family and friends which in those days was a lot of money and it was enough to get started and now over the years the trading side evolved into what's become well known in the industry as tops and why don't you touch a little bit on that evolution and what TOPS has become? That was really Ian's genius and vision. And it's actually started with a discussion about how we measured our brokers. And like most people in those days, it was pretty random. It was kind of a quarterly finger in the air. Who's done a good job? They get X share of the wallet. And Ian said, well, there must be a better way of measuring this and doing it systematically. And we asked Anthony Clake, at that stage was a 21-year-old summer trainee, still at Oxford, to think about how to do that. And he came up with the idea of giving the 40 brokers who covered us at that time a virtual portfolio. 
and said, you run this virtual portfolio, we'll measure whether you actually create any alpha, any value. And much to my surprise, because I was pretty skeptical about it, I had the typical arrogance of a buy side guy, they actually generated a lot of alpha. And so we, having measured it for about a year, we then said, or Ian said, let's put some capital behind this. And we put, by that stage, Eureka was a kind of two, two and a half billion dollar fund. We put 200 million, so 10% of the fund, into a program which basically replicated the ideas of all of the brokers who were sending them in, the ideas into us in real time. And it got off to a huge flying start, 2002. And so how has that evolved over the years? It's been an amazing evolution because when we started it, we didn't even optimize between the contributors. We just took every portfolio equal weighted. We didn't try and allocate, optimize, and so on. It moved in a series of steps. First of all, we started looking just optimizing between those portfolios. And then we started saying, well, you can actually optimize individuals and you can analyze their skill. You can analyze what some are good at and what they're not good at, whether it's longs and shorts, which sectors they're good at, which market environments they're good at. And then you can start to blend them with each other in different ways and score, create signals for the strength of the alpha in each person, in each portfolio. And you looked at the patterns and relationships between the portfolios. We then globalized it. So we took it to US and to Asia and did the same thing. And then there was a whole other level of complexity when we started introducing other systematic signals that other that competitors used, kind of pure systematic funds, and blending those signals with the top alpha contributor signals. And it's continued to, to evolve and evolve every year with new types of signals, extra complexity, and it's now a highly sophisticated and complex optimization process. But the underlying personality and driver of it remains the alpha signals from the individual contributors. So if we look at Marshall Waste today, how did the investments get made across these strategies? So we've always worked on the basis, first of all, that we were size constrained in everything we did. And that led us to allow different strategies to develop their life and to distribute the capital as much as possible, really. And because of all the benefits of diversification, which I talk about in the book, and, and the benefits of blending, you can blend lots and lots of different alpha signals. So the way Marshall Waste has evolved is we have a huge number of different signals which we're blending together in the systematic side, which includes both the top business we still call tops and a systematic business in its own right. Then we have the fundamental side, which has evolved from having essentially one strategy when we started to now there's around 15 strategies run by fundamental managers and covering different sectors and different geographies. But they also then benefit from all of the infrastructure of the firm and use a lot of information that they can get from the, the systematic side as inputs into their decision making. And we've also now introduced quantum mental investing, which is effectively use that word to refer to non-traditional types of information sources. So mobility data, emails, social media data, retail, etc., etc. So that's another source of information and alpha signals which we can blend into the results. But what you have in the end is multiple, multiple strategies which are all good in their own right, which are blending together to give a, a very high return per unit of risk. We could dive in for hours on this. I know we're going to turn to the book, but I do want to ask, when you have, say, the top structure, which are sort of external broker recommendations, and then you have these 15 internal strategies. What do you see as the strengths and weaknesses as an organization of sourcing the ideas internally versus externally? The advantage of sourcing them externally is you can do what you want with their ideas. Their feelings are never going to be heard. You can virtually hire and fire. So you can effectively, if you choose, have 600 million of capital which follows the ideas of a person. They won't know that, but you can be using that, they're almost in an undiluted, you could if you choose, on an undiluted way, use one person's ideas. You have to put them back on your book. You have all of the headache of having a good contract, et cetera, et cetera, which is a much more complicated thing. The managers that we do have on our books are all people we're very committed to, and we have a very, very 
low turnover compared with any other of the comparable funds who have lots of managers. People stay with us a very long time, most of them indefinitely, because we believe in backing their skill and we believe they're skillful. There is a stickiness to that, which you don't have with the external contributors. And then the other thing is, with the external contributors, you can blend their signals with lots and lots of other signals to create effectively almost a completely new product. And again, nobody's going to get hurt. Whereas if I took alpha signals from internal managers and you know said, this guy's good at healthcare, so I'm going to use that the healthcare signal, he's going to, or she is pretty quickly going to say, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're piggybacking on me. And so the data, data is not needy. It doesn't have a personality. It's not demanding. So you, you can do much more. That's the big advantage of the external data. And the big advantage, I would say, that fundamental managers have over systematic investing generally is their ability to react quickly to a new paradigm. And so when you get a big event in markets, you're typically at least for two or three months. And we had this with both Brexit and Trump. The fundamental managers reacted faster and did better than the systematic side. But I would say in the coronavirus, actually, it's been the other way around. The the TOPS contributors did better than our fundamental managers in reacting to COVID. And then as you and Ian sitting on the top of this organization, how do you work through your own behavioral biases, especially relating to the internal teams where you have sunk costs and if you have the sense that the alpha has deteriorated, it's much harder emotionally to make that change. I guess there's kind of long-term convictions and then there's biases. We have a long-term conviction that skill is persistent, that if somebody is good, they stay good. Unless, almost invariably, when it goes wrong, it's actually a character thing rather than a skill issue. So people can go wrong for character reasons, as I talk about in the book, whether it's hubris, issues in their personal life, divorce, death, disease. There are lots of things that can go wrong for people personally, and then you have to deal with that. If it goes wrong at the level of the portfolio, you have to evaluate, was it luck? Have they changed their approach such that what we identified as the persistent source of skill is no longer viable? And those are all decisions we have to take. And they're decisions we try to take together as well, because one of the best ways of fighting against biases is to have several voices in the room to challenge each other and work out what is actually empirical and what is based on a bias or emotion. So I want to turn to the book and almost as a premise, and obviously a premise of the organization is this deep belief you have in active management, which in many ways is under pressure. I'm just going to I'm going to read off this quote that just distills the essence of this. Markets are highly complex, nonlinear systems created by a myriad of half-informed or uninformed decisions made by fallible human agents with multiple cognitive biases. Or in other words, markets are screwed up. (laughs) Yeah. And of course, Adam Smith would say the end result of that is the invisible hand and you get the right outcomes. And I would also subscribe to that. But where I think that the philosophical underpinnings of of academia have gone wrong is that in order to be able to create any tools or be useful, academics had to build some assumptions and they built the assumption that markets are efficient. And that in some ways is a useful assumption to make if you're trying to create the black skulls model or to create index funds or so on, but it's not true. And so, as I said at the beginning of the book, there is this remarkable disconnect between theory and practice, between what's taught in schools and what actually you learn in markets. And indeed, the whole investment management industry, both allocators and managers, is built on the premise that skill is persistent. And once you have identified sources of alpha, they persist, not necessarily indefinitely, because people can try and eventually erode that alpha, but they persist. And the way people deal and the way the agents in the market constantly evolve means that some sources of alpha disappear and other sources of alpha emerge. And that's why I talk about the need to be constantly adapting because the markets are constantly changing because they are effectively organic entities. That quote you gave is because I was trying to encapsulate all of the multiple ways in which they are difficult and complex and not efficient and not not reductive. So as a starting point, you do have 
a fair amount of scrutiny around the world in active management and generally, particularly in, say, the long-only equity markets because of this persistence of called broad-based underperformance relative to index funds. So how do you weigh out what you see in these inefficiencies that can move and adapt and you have to adapt? And on the other hand, the ability to capture them with so many smart participants in the marketplace? I think the main concession I would make to the Chicago School to Efficient Market Theory, the only concession, is that markets are gradually getting less inefficient. And that's because they are professionalizing. So I think the US has gone from, in the 1970s, 50% retail to today, 15. And I think in 1907, it was something like 85% retail. And China today, is 85% retail and 15% professional. Professionals inherently have much more information, especially today, than the retail investor. And therefore, as the people around the poker table get smarter, it gets more difficult. And so we are seeing a, a process of winnowing out of the people around the table. That leads you, therefore, to look at China as a better source of alpha, theoretically at least, than the United States, which is the most professionalized market. But at the same time as that is happening, you're getting all kinds of new inefficiencies emerging. So, you know, whether it be index funds, which are themselves just a form of lag momentum, or whether it be the fact that a significant number of part of the hedge fund industry kind of totally focuses on quarterly earnings. And you get this phenomenon now of massive crowding around quarterly earnings, which actually is becoming less and less efficient as a, a way of extracting value. Or the recent David Portnoy phenomenon, retail buying. Tesla is up 400% in three months. And so you're getting these new phenomenon due to new things happening in the nature of the participants in the market. So it's constantly changing, but it is gradually getting more professionalized. That's for sure. You have this premise that I think a lot of people would question that skill itself is measurable and repeatable. Tell me where that comes from. That really comes from tops in the sense that in terms of the evidence. So it is interesting that um, Farmer, the founder of Vision Market Theory, never really produced proof that markets were efficient. It was an assumption. And whereas it's proof of skill is a very, very large data set. I mean, we have 1,000, well, historically, up as a 3,000 people who've contributed to tops and been measured for long periods, three, five, ten 20 years in some cases. And so you are able to measure people, individuals in a whole bunch of different market regimes. And the kind of surface numbers wouldn't necessarily give you maybe, the fact that some people consistently do well and some don't. Somebody would say, well, you get a bell curve and you probably you might find that some there's, it, there's a kind of normal distribution. But if you then dig down into it and you look at what we call success ratios, I think in your country you call them batting average. But if you begin to see that the individual not only consistently delivers alpha, but their success ratio is consistently between 50 and 60%. So they're consistently getting it more right than wrong. There's a skew in there. And then you can look at how that works in different sectors, in countries and so on, and, and their longs and their shorts. You get so much texture in the information that you really have high statistical conviction that there is something here which is a variable which you can call alpha, which is this factor which is persistent there in the results. And is the skill in that context, then it sounds like it's just stock selection. That's what we're measuring now. But I'm sure the same would apply in the macro world. There are great macro investors and there are less good macro investors. And you could measure their trades, you could measure the skew, you could measure in different regimes, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's the same thing. What have you found are the optimal ways to then transfer, let's say, the presence of stock selection alpha into a portfolio that delivers? In the top part of our business, so your target you measure alpha specifically is the thing that you're trying to capture. And in fact, the other word for tops is alpha capture. So the thing that you're putting into the portfolio is not a return. The thing you're optimizing is not a return objective, it's an alpha objective. So it's the performance of those ideas against whatever the benchmark is. And you create information ratios and risk manage around the alpha. And for our managers, it's actually the same thing. When we optimize between our managers, 
we optimize to their alpha. We're not optimizing to return. We're optimizing to alpha. And so they get capital if they do well with their alpha. And again, and so for our, for our fundamental managers, we end up with the same level of complexity in how we evaluate their alpha as we do on tops. And how does that come together in terms of constructing portfolios, right? On the one hand, you could say, oh, these are all equally weighted by positions, adjust for liquidity, whatever it is. And on the other hand, you could then optimize on the particular skills across stock selection, a sector, a market regime. One of the 10 and a half lessons in your book is the, the notion that the best portfolio construction combines concentration and diversification. What do you mean by that? It's a paradox because the two things should be antithetical. And so diversification, Markowitz, risk managers love diversification. It brings clear benefits in terms of return per unit of risk and all good portfolio construction should be aiming to achieve a minimum level of diversification. But for stock pickers, my view is that most managers, few managers have more than 10 or 20 high convictions at any one time. And for that reason, one of the constraints in the top system is that we are the contributor portfolios. The contributors are only expect to run about 10 names in their book. We say, we only want your highest convictions. Don't give us, you don't you worry about diversification. Just give us your highest convictions and we'll worry about the diversification. And because we want that concentration within our individual managers, we also encourage them to put a high amount of their risk in their top convictions. And so those two things, how do they combine? Well, they don't combine at the level of one portfolio. They combine at the level of the product that you deliver to the client. So that's why Eureka evolved from being one strategy when Ian and I ran it to being now combining 15 strategies, which we think is the kind of minimal level of diversification you need. And that then delivers to the client a set of very interesting alpha streams. Each one is relatively concentrated. You put them all together you have a highly diverse portfolio full of high conviction ideas. That's the thing. And TOPS is even more like that. Let's talk a little bit about the short side specifically. Very different game than the longs. What are the key lessons you've learned from shorting all these years? I say in the book that the kind of tautology, um, the statement of the obvious, that shorts and longs are very different. And if you look at the long-term record of the Eureka Fund as a proxy, our long-term annualized alpha on the long side is about 9% and on the short side about 3%. And I think that short side is actually probably a quite a creditable result in the context of the industry. And provided your short side is positive, short hour is positive, then it allows you to really deploy your long uh, book very aggressively. The first reason for a difference is that the information bias of the market is set up completely for the long side. So the brokers essentially seek to please companies 70 to 80 percent of all recommendations are buy or holds that's 50 plus percent of them are buys so your short seller is competing against in a world where information bias is against him or her it's also competing in a world which is inherently it's more expensive because you have a borrowing cost so there's a bigger hurdle before you make money it's much more competitive because when you short a stock obviously you're competing against long and short sellers but you're Effectively, when you're borrowing a stock, you're competing only against short sellers. And they are, because they're essentially hedge fund managers, they're typically amongst the smarter people in the market. And the availability of the borrow is reflected in the cost. So actually, your cost, you're competing against people who, if they have the same idea as you, they drive up the cost. That's where the competition comes through. So it is a more difficult game, and it requires more trading. You're up against short squeezes you're up against crowding in a way you're not on the long side. So it requires you to be much more active in the way you trade and flexible in mind. In terms of our experience, we actually just had one of our best ever experiences as a firm on the short side, which was Wirecard, where we were the second biggest disclosed short. It's for your US listeners. I mean, Wirecard is pretty much the European Enron, really. It's a massive fraud in the payments market. And it was a $14 billion market cap which had a AAA from Moody's, was approved, audited and approved by uh, Ernst & Young. And the Baffin, the, the German regulator, suspended short selling on it in 2018 to stop people selling short on the request of the company. And to the extent that one hedge fund manager has threatened to sue them. 
So that you're up against all the usual culprits, Moody's, accountants, regulators, and so on, and against the informational bias of the market. But we held that position for two years. And then when it went, it went like a puff of smoke. It went from about a $12 billion market cap to zero in three days. There's a line that I quote in the book, The Sun Also Rises from Ernest Hemingway, a guy called Jake Campbell, who, who was a bankrupt and was asked, so how did you go bankrupt? He said, well, it's quite simple, slowly and then quickly. And it's rather like that with a lot of shorts. You have to be very, very resilient over a long time. And then suddenly you get your payback. When you have all of those structural obstacles to success on the short side, how have you thought about delivering value on it today compared to, say, 23 years ago when it was much less crowded, much less costly, rates were higher, and a lot of those headwinds today were tailwinds? So I think the other thing I would add, by the way, for the last 10 years, the monetary regime means that companies can just even today, actually, raise capital at the drop of a hat. There's always capital to help to bail out weak companies, whereas there was a time when, I think pre-2008, actually, when if a company got into difficulty, there was a real problem financing themselves, and therefore there was a lot of juice in the short. A lot of that juice is less easy to get. So we've evolved quite a lot of the tools we use to risk manage shorts, and we measure crowding and incorporate crowding as a risk factor in the way we look at our portfolios. So, And the irony, of course, is that the crowdedness of a short is a sign that it's a good short, i.e. it's going to go down, because smart money thinks you should be short. But crowdedness of a short causes it to be much more volatile in the market. And when you get these periods of mean reversion, when hedge funds have to do gear, shorts go up in your face, and that's very difficult to manage. So you have, there's a trade-off in terms of how much crowdedness you can tolerate in any portfolio because of the risk of a reversion in the market. So that's the main way we manage it. And how do you implement that? We have rules about individual stocks, both on the long and the short side, in terms of how big we can be in the positions. But we also implement it at aggregate level. So we have a crowdedness factor. So we have a Z-score approach to measuring short crowding on every stock. And so you can get a sense of how crowded they are. You know, for a long time between tops and the fundamental investing, you've had some semblance of optimization and machine work, sort of data crunching and investing that way. And then, of course, on the fundamental side, what's been your assessment of this question of man versus machine? Uh, well, I, I started that chapter. It's not a quote from anybody, but it's a kind of paraphrasing of Kasparov. A machine beats a man, but a man plus a machine beats a machine. And that was certainly the conclusion he came to after he lost the deep blue. And so we think that the best way forward is to blend the two. Now, we, at the moment, we keep our business in a way separate. So we've got one side, which is fundamental, which is using more and more data and more and more processing power and new all kinds of new data sets to help give our managers an edge. And on the other side, we have top system systematic, which is always different from any other systematic system because it uses human beings as its prime and human cognition as its primary driver of the origin of the idea. So we try and keep those two things apart for the good of the business, actually, because you want to maintain lots of different alpha streams and alpha sources and keep them distinct. But wherever the industry goes, and you can have all kinds of debates about where the industry will be in 10 years. We think that we are in an incredibly good position because we have these two building blocks. And certainly you can't call the end of fundamental investing at all. I think fundamental investing evolves, but it evolves to incorporate more and more data, but still with guys pulling the trigger at the top. How have you thought about this real question of the evolution of the industry? We think about it all the time. There are some trends which are they seem to be so structural that nothing's going to shift. So the, the index, the trend of indexation, which is about 2 or 3% a year or whatever, that's almost like a straight line. So there's going to be more and more money going to indexation, which I would call that hollowing out of slightly sleepy active managers in the middle of the spectrum. And you will end up with a large amount of equity assets which are run passively. And then you'll have a small group which is run very actively i.e. primarily through hedge funds and alternative investments. And you'll have the best of the best 
active managers will still have a, a role to play, I think. I don't think it'll ever get to a point of being completely passive. There'll always be huge new pockets of inefficiency opened up by the way the industry evolves. I'd be very cautious about making big predictions about the industry anyway. I think what we're more interested in is anticipating the opportunities of the next two to five years. So things we're looking at at the moment, we've launched an ESG fund, and that's a very exciting area, which we, having been pretty cynical about it as an alpha source, we now think actually it's going to be pretty alpha rich. And we're also looking at the crossover space, which is a space between public and private. And it's, it's almost becoming a, a new place in the market, which is kind of doesn't really fit into any category. And it's the line's getting very blurred between public and private. So there are lots of things that are changing. And those are the things where areas where you have opportunities. Where do you and Ian most disagree about the near term or medium term future of the industry? I think that possibly reflecting our biases and backgrounds, Ian has always been much more bullish about the systematic side of the business than me. And there was a time when he was pretty cautious about fundamental investing. But I would say now, actually, we're in a very similar place. We're both bullish about systematic side and we're both bullish about the fundamental side. I think the biggest difference between Ian and I is actually our biases when it comes to investing. As I say in the book, I have an optimism bias and Ian has a mean reversion bias. And that was actually very good when we were running money together because we de-risked each other. Our, our biases were completely offsetting, but it was also quite strained. We could uh, disagree a lot. So one of the things you talk about in the book is the importance of size, which is a more nuanced and complex issue than size is the enemy of performance. But on the other hand, you said as the industry evolves, you get a little bit more concentration in the, in the alpha generators. So how have you thought about size of asset management firms? There's a chapter which is called Size Matters. And the real argument there is that although you need a certain amount of size to have critical mass and pay the bills, Beyond a certain level, size is most of the time a disadvantage. And so it's a sadness to me in a way that there are so many barriers to entry now and that it is getting more concentrated. But the point that follows from that is we've built our business all the way through by recognizing that size matters. Beyond a certain point, your returns are handicapped by the friction costs of trading or by your footprint in the market, your liquidity footprint. And that's why we closed Eureka when it was 2 billion in 2001, gave back capital. And we've frequently closed our funds all the way through the life of the firm. And the paradox about Marshall Waste is we've grown to be the largest equity hedge fund in Europe because, in my opinion, we constantly closed. Because other people grew to be big and blew up because they were too big. Their size fell for the wrong reason. In our case, we said, right, the, the maximum we can do in this strategy is X. 1 billion, 2 billion, 5 billion, it's now closed. And that put the onus on us then to say, well, how can we innovate to find other ways of generating alpha? And so that's how our growth has been slow. And it's been based on that hindrance. Constraints are also very creative. So that hindrance has been a source of creativity for us. Now that dovetails with your last half lesson, that most fund management careers end in failure. And why don't you walk through that? sobering (laughs) lesson. That's based on an English politician called Enoch Powell who said the same thing about politics. And it's probably true in spades of fund management because first of all, there's the size problems. As you say, many fund managers grow too big and then their returns just decay. They can decay gently into the night or they can decay rapidly because they're really just far too much hubris. That's one point. The second one is is to do with hubris itself and the effects of being successful in our industry. It's a, very, it's a pretty ego-driven industry, fund management, especially the hedge fund. End. I would say it's even worse in the US than the UK because in the US, people equate your wealth with your worth. You also have the problem that in the hedge fund world, a lot of firms are 100% owned by one person and that compounds it. So you get culture where there isn't enough challenge, there isn't enough I don't know, people willing to contradict. The founder and the driver gets impatient of being disagreed with, believes his own hype or her own hype and so on and so forth. So there are many, many reasons why 
it can go badly. It tends towards hubris and nemesis. And there are some great names. Julian Robertson's a great example. There's a guy in Britain, Neil Woodford, who's just had a huge blow up. I mean, there are lots of lots of new and recent and old examples of it. And it also it's it's amplified by money flows. So money follows people who've done well just because of the historic record. They get lots of money. Then they get too big and they do things that they shouldn't with the, you know, they go into a liquid areas. And then you get the unwind. There's a rush to unwind. So the fall is amplified by by that kind of cycle of money, which also follows the hubris nemesis. So it's really an industry which you've got to be very careful about. So given that risk, why write a book? Well, I guess partly I wanted to read write it before I failed. So I get it out. And I just thought that was Actually, this started as a, a talk at a conference. And I thought, actually, this I wouldn't mind just getting this all down because I think it's worth writing it down. It's just enough to make a book. It's quite a short book. And the other part, I suppose, is philosophically, there's something I wanted to get across, which I feel strongly about. Because the, the underlying theme is you all the way through is really fallibility, human fallibility and inefficiency of markets and uncertainty and all of these things and that message needs to be out there because especially today because there is a, on a much broader scale there is a kind of a crisis of epistemology in the world people are arguing now not only about what they believe but about how they know anything empiricism versus rationalism but then in the new woke white fragility environment there is a complete rejection of reason as a simply something that comes from the patriarchy and so on. And, and you must actually reject reason because there is no such thing as truth. So truth is simply what you perceive and what a person who's more powerful than you tells you is the truth. So there's a crisis, in my opinion, of philosophy. And that applies to our industry, curiously, because there is a... The way I wrote about it in the book, there's a, I'm advocating empiricism versus what I call rationalism, which I think were two different branches of the Enlightenment. And I think rationalism is very damaging. It's the kind of excessive belief in the power of reason and the excessive reliance on axiomatic thinking, which is what happens in the economic profession. Ultimately, because it's flawed, it will become discredited. So I guess the thing that I wanted to last in the book is that the thinking around that, which is in the introduction, which is how you should think about thinking. This question of human fallibility hits our industry on both sides, right? Because you're making the case that markets are inefficient because of human fallibility. But then there's this question of, well, it's humans that then need to take advantage of the inefficiencies and the humans themselves are fallible. So how have you thought about that kind of philosophical debate? That's just fallibility upon fallibility. Some of us are more fallible than others. And some of us are more fallible at different periods of our time than ourselves. Our own fallibility is it varies over time. But I do recognize that there are, within all of that, there are people who are skillful, more skillful than others, and are able to take more advantage. But ultimately, it anchors into a kind of deeper theory of man. And Pascal said, man is just a reed, but a thinking reed. So we're a thinking creature, but we're very, very fragile underneath all the thinking. And our thinking is very motivated. I'd be remiss if we didn't touch on a little bit of, there was a period of time a few years ago where you stepped away from day-to-day -day fund management and explored a few interests of yours that led to, among other things, the word sir in front of your name these days. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about that interest in education and politics. I've always had a great interest in politics, and I actually stood for parliament before we stood up Marshall Wings, but I chose the wrong party. I've always chosen, till recently, I've always chosen the wrong party. But in uh, 2005, the party that I did support, which was the Liberal Democrats, which is, by the way, a very different party today from what it was then, looked like it was on the brink of going into government. So I wanted to spend some time supporting that, trying to shift their policy on a number of issues, particularly on the economy. So behind the scenes and through a think tank to try and change the, the, their program and then help them with getting into power. And that was 2005 to 2008, roughly. And I was wondering whether to go into politics at a certain point there, but I decided not to, which was a very good decision, and came back to Marshall Ways. The educational side has always been, if you like, my interest in education, which came through our, the charity that Ian and I were involved in setting up, which is ARC. 
But that's also integral to the way I think about politics because I'm classical liberal approach to politics basically anchors itself in the idea of equality of opportunity and giving everybody the same chance. If you don't really commit to trying to make education work for everybody, then you're a kind of a fake, in my view, in terms of uh, being a traditional classical liberal. And by the way, I think the US education system absolutely stinks in terms of providing equality of opportunity. And Britain's in a better place on that. Those were the things that I spent time on, and I worked closely with the education minister at the time on, on, on reforming the education system in Britain. Well, I want to turn to a couple of closing questions. But before we do that, as if this weren't enough, this phenomenally successful firm and the things you've done outside, you have some children that are not in this business. <laughs> I don't know as much about your daughter's musical career, but certainly your son, Winston, who some may know on this side of the pond and about his path. He used to call himself Country Winston, but uh, he um, announced to us he was playing guitar from early teens and he decided very early on that he was going to go into the music business. And he set up a, a venue in uh, the King's Road, which was one of the, kind of a little scene. He took over a pub and he brought together lots of musicians. And out of that came Mumford and Sons. And they've had a, they're a brilliant bunch of guys. And I'm very proud to be associated with them. They're wonderful live musicians and they write great music. And so it's a great source of joy for Sabina and I, my wife and I. And our daughter is also a great musician, and she's solo pianist, a vocalist. She's done an album. She's currently studying at Berkeley, Berkeley Music College, virtually. Yeah, odd thing. Much better career than mine. What's been the most surprising thing about watching Winston's career with Mumford & Sons? Well, the speed of their success, I think. Because we were going to gigs when half a dozen people in a pub, and then... They had a star quality. We had quite a lot of confidence in them. And then the speed with which they went from with their first album to getting BAFTAs and Grammys was amazing. All right, a few closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Planting trees and reading history. Hard to do at the same time, but... uh... (laughs) They both have something to do with longevity, trying to uh, either go back in the past or find something that outlasts you. What's your most important daily habit? Prayer. I pray every morning with my wife and it anchors you. It helps you understand there's something more important than you every day. And is there a breadth of what it is you pray about? You start with the people closest to you and then move out. But it's most about the people around you, your family, your friends, your work. All right. On the less serene side, what's your biggest pet peeve? Probably cue barging. Is that what the Americans say, cue barging? People who jump in the queue. I don't know why. I think it's hereditary. I get so agitated by people who jump in the queue. Really, really gets my goat. How about your biggest investment pet peeve? Well, I think going back to some of the earlier conversation, I think it's when people bring our industry into disrepute because by things like gating and charging fees on the gating or just letting down the the investors because... Effectively, fund management in Britain, it's less so in the States, but Britain has a pretty mixed reputation. We have a serious responsibility, which is stewarding other people's money. And that should be seen as a sacred responsibility, not just a way of getting rich. And so when I see bad behavior, I think it's just bad for all of us. It's bad for Marshall Waste when we be in that industry where that happens, and it's bad for the industry, and it's bad for the clients. What was your biggest mistake, and what did you learn from it? Well, I was over-promoted when I was young. I think I touched on it. I was given money to manage far too early. So my biggest mistake was in 1991, the first Gulf War. Saddam invaded Kuwait in August 1990. And then the US invasion was until January 91. And I got bared up on, on the oil price. I thought it was going to go up further and was very long oil oil stocks and oil service stocks going into January, February. And obviously I got wiped out. I guess there are two lessons. First, never underestimate the American military. And then the second, I mean, the old age old, you sell on the sound of bugles and you buy on the, on the sound of guns. And I didn't do that. I had an Anna's horrible, it's terrible performance. I had to spend 
five or six years rebuilding my performance record. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I had great parents. I have a sister. We were very lucky. But I'd say that it was a combination of setting boundaries and then giving freedom. They nailed it, I think, in terms of that combination and, and gradually releasing the boundaries. All right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? Fallibility, including my own. I learned it in 1991, big time, but I mean, you carry on learning it every day. But I think once you realize your own fallibility, the ego becomes less of a obstacle and less of a handicap. Paul or Sir Paul? should say. Thank you so much for taking the time. <laughs> Don't go there. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Ted. Okay, take care. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show and I thank you for it. Have a good one and see you next time. 